Okay, everybody, today we're going to talk about the overall structure of the nervous system. This is sort of the, the eagle-eyed view of the whole nervous system and how it's all organized. And then over the course of the semester, we'll be filling in more details about the, uh, the functions of specific parts of the brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nervous system. Okay, so the nervous system is divided up into two main parts. They are the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. The central nervous system is just the brain and the spinal cord, shown in yellow here. Everything down the center of the body. The peripheral nervous system is everything else. You can see all these little black lines running through the rest of the body. Those indicate nerves and ganglia, and those make up the peripheral nervous system. All the nervous tissue, all the neurons and glia, outside the brain and spinal cord. We can divide up the peripheral nervous system into two smaller parts, the somatic division and the autonomic division. The somatic division is important for voluntary muscle activity and conscious perception of the body. So the somatic nervous system consists of sensory nerves going to the brain. These carry messages from special reporters in the skin called receptors, receptors in the muscles, receptors and other internal and external sense organs. They take these messages to the spinal cord and then to the brain. Also in the somatic nervous system are motor nerves. These are uh, axons coming from the brain and spinal cord uh, out to the muscles and glands telling them to do different things. The muscles to contract, the glands to produce uh, hormones and so forth. And this is just showing you uh, a, a spinal nerve. This is one level of the spinal cord here. You can see that sensory information, shown by these blue axons here, comes in the dorsal root of the spinal cord. This is a cross-section through the spinal cord. Sensory information comes in through the dorsal root, and then movement information, motor output, comes out through the ventral root of the spinal cord, and then they combine to form nerves that carry these signals to different parts of the body. You could think of the nerves in a way like, uh, like USB cables that are relaying signals from the, the CPU, the brain and spinal cord, out to peripheral devices, things like your, the sensory receptors in your hands or the muscles in your arms and so forth. And then also in the peripheral nervous system is the autonomic division. That can also be subdivided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. So the autonomic nervous system overall permits involuntary functioning of blood vessels, glands, internal organs like the bladder, the stomach, the heart, uh, the digestive tract. You can think of the autonomic system as the automatic system. It, it takes care of lots of different bodily functions kind of automatically outside of conscious awareness for the most part. The sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, you can think of its function as being fight or flight. So it prepares the body for action, mobilizes the body's resources for action. For example, it increases heart rate, elevates blood pressure, uh, releases um, adrenaline into your bloodstream. So it gets the body ready to fight or flee. Although it, it may be tempting to think of this as being overall activation, there are things that the sympathetic nervous system deactivates. For example, digestion. You don't need to be digesting your peas and carrots while you're running away from a bear. You want those, those resources devoted to, to your muscles so you can get out of there. And then once you've uh, made it back to camp, then the parasympathetic nervous system would take over or become more active, relatively more active, and would then sort of turn on your digestion again or increase the rate of digestion. So you can think of the parasympathetic nervous system as being the rest and digest system. It's kind of like the brakes on your car, slowing things down, allowing the body to take care of basic vegetative functions, conserving energy, storing energy, uh, basic metabolic functions. The autonomic nervous system functions by controlling or influencing the activity of multiple targets, autonomic targets, throughout the body. These are tissues and organs that are influenced directly by the uh, innervation from the autonomic nervous system. Almost all of these targets, things like the heart, <coughs> things like your uh, pupil dilation, things like uh, digestion, 
uh, even the diameter of airways inside your lungs and so forth. All of these can be influenced by the autonomic nervous system. And almost all of them have innervation from both the sympathetic branch and the parasympathetic branch. And you can see that shown in here. So uh, these blue lines, it says they're green, but they sort of look blue. These blue or green lines indicate the parasympathetic output. And you can see the heart, for example, gets both sympathetic input and parasympathetic input. So in these axons, the axons in this nerve, the sympathetic nerve, are more active, it would tend to increase heart rate. When the activation in the parasympathetic nerve increases, it would tend to decrease heart rate. In fact, uh, this nerve right here, the parasympathetic nerve, is the vagus nerve, the one we learned about in the context of synapses. It's the one that Otto Louis stimulated to decrease the heart rate in the frog's heart that he was experimenting with. You can think of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems as kind of pushing and pulling uh, the activity of these organs in different directions. Okay, next up, let's focus on the central nervous system. First, let's talk about the spinal cord. So we've seen this already. This is the general structure of the spinal cord. Note that inside the spinal cord, the organization of white matter and gray matter is different than in the brain. In the brain, you've got the cerebral cortex and the cerebellar cortex, that thin sheet of gray matter that sort of surrounds the brain on the outside, and the, the white matter tends to be on the inside. In the spinal cord, things are organized differently. The white matter, shown in sort of yellow and white hatching here, is on the outside. So this is all white matter here. Axons traveling up and down the spinal cord, carrying information from the body up to the brain and from the brain down to the body. But inside the spinal cord is a, a long column of gray matter. And then there's the, the central canal here, kind of a, a long tube filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So this gray matter, as you know, is made up of somas and dendrites. And here are some somas being shown here. So this is where some information processing occurs. This is where um, many spinal reflexes are housed, the circuitry for those reflexes. And also uh, there are central pattern generators that are in here. We'll talk about those a little later in the semester. The simplest kinds of behaviors that we do take place as a result of circuitry right in the spinal cord. So just taking as an example the uh, patellar tendon reflex. If your physician goes and hits your patellar tendon right underneath your kneecap, it causes a fast stretch in that tendon and in the quadriceps mus muscle on the, the front of your thigh. That fast stretch is detected by uh, sensory receptors. And then these sensory receptors, their axons shown here, travel up through the leg into the dorsal root of the spinal cord where they make a synapse with one or more interneurons, again in the gray matter of the spinal cord on the inside. And then that circuitry makes a synapse with motor neurons, which then travel back down that nerve to the muscle that just got stretched and then contract that muscle. This all happens without conscious involvement, without voluntary effort. It just happens. In fact, you could sever the spinal cord right here, and this would still happen. Now we're on to the brain. We can divide up into the brain into f three main sections. They are the hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. You can see the forebrain is by far the largest. Let's start with the hindbrain. You can see that it includes the cerebellum, the pons, and the medulla. The medulla is important for things like regulating your breathing, re regulating your heart rate. The pons here is important for uh, regulating sleeping, waking, starting the, uh, the REM cycle. Both of these also have lots and lots of axons. In fact, they're mainly just white matter tracts carrying axons from the spinal cord up to the brain and from the brain down to the spinal cord. Running along inside the pons and the medulla, and even a little bit into the membrane, is something called the reticular activating system, which is important for um, 
altering or regulating or manipulating your level of alertness, attention, and arousal. And then there's the cerebellum, shown here. It's important for balance and coordination. At least these are the functions that are most obviously affected when you have damage to the cerebellum. Turns out that its role in information processing the brain is much more complicated than that and more nuanced. We'll get into that more later. Next up is the midbrain. You can see it's relatively much smaller. It includes the cerebral peduncle right here and the superior and inferior colliculus. The superior colliculus is important for generating certain kinds of eye movements right there. Just ventral to it, the inferior colliculus is part of the auditory pathway, the pathway for hearing that processes the, uh, the sounds that you hear. Inside the cerebral peduncle is also the substantia nigra, a part of the brain that gets uh, damaged in Parkinson's disease <coughs> and results in some of the main motor deficits that you see in Parkinson's. <coughs> and then also the ventral tegmentum, which we'll see later is part of the reward pathway that's important for addiction. And then last but not least is the forebrain, shown here. It includes the thalamus right in here, which serves as kind of a relay station for all but one of your sensory inputs. So the sight of a sunset is sort of relayed up to the visual parts of cortex, auditory information relayed to the auditory parts of cortex in the temporal lobe. The only sense that doesn't go through the thalamus is smell, which has its own private switching station, which is the olfactory bulb. There are other functions that the thalamus serves as well, other nuclei in the thalamus that regulate other functions, but uh, one of the biggest functions is to relay information up to cortex. Then the hypothalamus is just ventral to the thalamus, just below it. It's involved with regulating quite a few basic drives associated with survival and reproduction primarily. So things like hunger, thirst, emotion, and sexual drives are regulated by the hypothalamus. Also in the forebrain you'll find the limbic system. I'm not showing you the whole thing here, but some of the more important structures that we're going to address later are the amygdala and the hippocampus, shown in blue here. The amygdala is critical for learning certain kinds of fear responses and interpreting stimuli with emotional consequences more generally. The hippocampus, as we'll see later, is important for certain kinds of memory, mainly uh, encoding long-term memory uh, and mainly memory for specific events and experiences. You'll notice that the left and right hippocampus come together and meet in the middle here. You might remember from sheep brain lab that this is the fornix. And then those axons come down and they actually uh, pass right down to the mammillary bodies, which are shown here. And then there's the cerebrum, the large uh, upper portion of the brain, which is, includes the cerebral cortex, shown circled in white here. This is a little bit of a caricature, but uh, you could think of the cerebrum as being crucial for higher thinking. Uh, most of the, the things that we consider that we associate with intelligence are going to rely heavily on the cerebral cortex in particular. It's divided into two halves called the cerebral hemispheres, and those are connected by a large band of axons called the corpus callosum. Huge white matter tract connecting the gray matter of the left hemisphere with the gray matter of the right hemisphere by way of about 100 million axons in humans. And the two cerebral hemispheres have slightly different functions. This is known as lateralization of function, uh, though the functions may not be the ones that you're used to associating with the left and the right hemisphere. A lot of the left brain, right brain stuff that you've heard about has little to no basis, in fact. We'll talk more about that toward the end of the semester. So here's the cerebral cortex, a thin layer, really several layers of gray matter covering the entire outside of the cerebrum. One continuous sheet covering each of the two hemispheres. And then here's the corpus callosum, that massive white matter tract in between. <coughs> 
You can also see the thalamus in this view. So this, uh, the cerebrum is covered by several thin layers of densely packed cells known as the cerebral cortex. We divide the cortex into four lobes. It's a little bit arbitrary how we divide up the cortex into four lobes. It could be five or six. The reason there are four lobes is because there are four bones, cranium bones, skull bones, overlying uh, the cerebral cortex. And the lobes are named after those bones. If we had had a different number of bones, I imagine we'd have a different number of lobes. There's nothing that really holds together the function or the structure of these lobes that makes one different from the other. But here they are, shown in shades of blue is the frontal lobe. In shades of red and pink is the parietal lobe. Shown in greenish here is the occipital lobe. And shown in orange is the temporal lobe. Temporal lobe you'll find under the temples. That's a one easy way to remember its location. Frontal lobe in the front. Parietal lobe and occipital lobe are a little harder to remember. I don't have a good mnemonic for those for you. I'll, uh, I'll briefly summarize some of the functions of these lobes, but we'll go over more specific functions over the course of the semester. So the frontal lobe, if you had to summarize it, you might say that it's important for action, for planning and executing action. And I mean all sorts of actions, planning long-term actions, especially the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex right about here. It's going to be important for maintaining information online, to use it, to work with it, uh, to foresee the consequences of your actions and plan uh, actions based on possible consequences. Uh, in the medial and ventral part of the brain, of, or the frontal lobe, we'll see is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex or orbital frontal cortex which is very important for certain kinds of emotional processes which we'll see later. Also here is primary motor cortex. This is the sort of last cortical output of movement signals which will then travel down the spinal cord and out to the muscles of the body. The parietal lobe has multiple representations of space housed within it using different coordinate systems. There are representations of space in terms of arm movements, in terms of uh, eye movements, and so forth. Uh, it's important for integrating what we see with what we do, integrating vision and action. The primary somatosensory cortex here is important for touch. This is the the first part of cortex that starts processing touch information coming from different parts of the body. Occipital lobe is crucial for vision. There are multiple uh, visual maps here, representations of what you're seeing repeated one after another. Visual processing continues down into the ventral part of the temporal lobe here, uh, but here it's mostly about identifying objects and uh, sort of extracting higher level features from the objects. The dorsal part of the temporal lobe is devoted mainly to hearing and uh, the posterior parts also are crucial for uh, comprehension of language. If you were to do a, uh, a coronal section here through the somatosensory cortex just in the anterior most part of the parietal lobe this part right here, shown in red. If you were to take a slice through that down, let's say, the left hemisphere, it might look something like this. So here's your, uh, your parietal lobe. Here's the medial wall, so there'd be another hemisphere over here. When you do that, you can see that there's a, a map of the body sort of drawn in a cartoony way over top of here. This is known as the somatosensory homunculus, or the little man. There's a somatotopic map. The topography of the soma, or body, is mapped out on this patch of cortex, such that each patch of cortex gets information primarily from one part of the body. So for example, if I were to touch your lips, you would see an increased activity in this part of the cortex right here. This was discovered uh, initially using research in animals, but later on a uh, uh, very famous neurosurgeon, Canadian neurosurgeon by the name of Wilder Penfield, 
uh, did surgeries with awake humans who had severe epilepsy and he stimulated different parts of somatosensory cortex with a weak electrical current and the awake patients reported feeling sensations in different parts of their body depending on where it is that they were being electrically stimulated. There's a similar map in motor cortex. Again, here's the primary motor cortex. This is now the frontal lobe. And there's a very similar map there with different parts of the body mapped out to different parts of cortex. But here, stimulating different parts of cortex with a weak electric current will actually generate movement in different parts of the body. So if you were to stimulate right here, you would get movements of the knee. Stimulate, mo stimulate the cortex here, you'd get movements of the hand. And if you'd stimulate movement, uh, cortex here, you'd get movements of parts of the face, jaw, or mouth. Now you'll notice that parts of the body are not represented in a way that's proportional to their actual size. And this sort of makes sense. We have much more fine sensory discrimination in our hands and in our face than we do in, let's say, our thigh or our back. Uh, that's in part because we've got more cortex representing, more sensory cortex representing the hand and the face than we do for other parts of the body. Likewise with movement, we have more cortex devoted to moving the hands. Think about all the amazing uh, fine movements that you can do with your hand, playing the piano, playing an instrument, uh, sewing, and so forth. Imagine trying to do that with your feet or uh, with your legs. You, generally speaking, we just don't have that kind of fine motor control, nor do we need it for these other larger parts of the body. But we do have very fine motor control over our face and our vocal apparatus, allowing us to speak and chew. These are some fun uh, sculptures. These are an artist's representation of what the body would look like if our body parts were proportional to their representation in sensory and motor cortex. You can see they're pretty similar. Uh, the somatosensory cortex has a huge face, especially the mouth and the tongue. We have lots of sensory receptors here and have very uh, fine discrimination of touch in these parts of the body. Likewise for the hands here, lots of sensory information coming from the hands, allowing us to uh, precisely know what it is that we're touching. Look at the hands in this motor homunculus, this motor model, just enormous. We have a tremendous amount of uh, fine motor control over our hands and of course also of our face and our mouth. So just to review, the nervous system is broken up into two main parts, the peripheral and the central nervous system. Peripheral nervous system divided again into two main parts, the somatic division and the autonomic division. Somatic division involves both uh, conscious perception of touch and other sensations from the body and also voluntary control of movements. The autonomic division, you can think of as the automatic division, controlling lots of things that are outside voluntary control, things like heart rate, digestion, and so forth. It's also divided up into two parts, the sympathetic division, the fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic division which mediates the rest and digest response. But these two divisions typically innervate all the autonomic targets, almost all the autonomic targets. There are some that only receive sympathetic input, but most receive input from both of these. But the inputs are sort of pushing the activity of those tissues in different directions. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The brain, we can divide up into three parts, forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. The forebrain consists of the basal ganglia, corpus callosum, cerebral cortex, thalamus, hypothalamus. We'll talk more about the basal ganglia later in the context of movement. The midbrain. And then the hindbrain consists of the cerebellum, medulla, and pons.